Good evening. Goodbye forever by Nat Chang Rinpoche. Chapter 8, Part 2. Steve said, I'm just glad that I can be open with my parents. So don't take this the wrong way, but do you tell them every time you have an erotic dream? Oh, Steve shook his head. It looks as if my idea that I'm open with my parents has just been shot down in flames. Sorry, that wasn't my intention, Steve. I just wanted to explain my situation and explain that I really do take the five precepts seriously while living as I live with what's important to me. Yes, said Steve, I can see that your father's made it hard or even impossible to be honest with him. So he's obviously responsible for your having to hide things from him. It's been so much easier for me, apart from, well, I decided not to fill in the words erotic dreams because I'd obviously embarrassed Steve with the way I'd applied logic in such a persistent manner. Good of you to see it that way. And that's why I always come here and you never come to my home. I don't blame you in the slightest because I'd rather be here than at home anyway. So, right, there are all kinds of dishonesty, aren't there? Steve pondered. I mean, my parents didn't tell your father what they thought of him over not letting you have the EBO base. I know they'd never met him, but yes. And they planned to give it to you on your 18th birthday knowing that he still wouldn't like it. Glad you see the point, Steve, I sighed. Not in exasperation with Steve, but exasperated with the situation in which I found myself. It pained me to have to break a precept, even though I was not breaking it to cause harm or give myself an unfair advantage over someone else. And of course, I don't see your parents as being anything other than honourable. My father's giving them no choice if they want to do something kind for me. True. So what about the sexual misconduct? Does that mean the same as in the Ten Commandments, like not committing adultery? Yes, but it means more than that. It means men or women not seeing each other as stereotypical or treating each other according to ideas that squeeze them into boxes. Right, Steve inquired. I think I understand what you mean, but could you give me an example of what that would look like? Well, that's easier than the first answer. It means that your girlfriend would be a real friend and not just a girl who would be some sort of hobby or pastime. You'd have intelligent conversations, not much different from the one we're having. Steve grinned, and that's how it is with Annalie. That's exactly how it is with Annalie. There's passion and there's conversation. We respect each other's opinions, even when we don't agree. When we don't agree, we talk about our different points of view, and there's always something to learn that is interesting. We discuss ideas, and we're good friends. Yes, I see that, Steve nodded. I think my father and mother are friends. They talk to each other a lot. He respects her classical music, she respects his jazz, and they both listen and enjoy it. They obviously have preferences, but they don't have to see each other's music as inferior or boring. And that 
that's Buddhism? Yes, that's Buddhism, as far as I understand it. But that doesn't mean that these ideas can't come about naturally if people are open-minded and if they avoid the standard indoctrination. Then, of course, there's not killing. That's fairly black and white, isn't it? Or, no, you should know that, Steve. Don't you remember about my Uncle Ben being part of the Brandenburg Company's plot to assassinate Hitler? Sorry, yes, that had slipped my mind. I remember you telling me about that and how he and his whole division got sent to the Russian front and wiped out in seconds. Yes, so that was a killing that would have been based on the motivation to end World War II. This is quite a valuable history for me because it's modern and because it happened in my own family history. There is a story about a sea captain who confesses to the Buddha that he's committed murder. He killed a robber on board his ship. The Buddha asked him about the circumstances and the sea captain tells him that the robber was going to sink the ship in order that 500 merchants would drown and he'd be able to salvage their gold. The Buddha tells him that his act was not a bad act because although he killed the robber, he had no hatred in his mind. His intention had been to save lives. That's really interesting, right? I prefer the story about your uncle because it's real. Not that the story of the Buddha and the sea captain isn't real, but it's so far away from anything that could happen now. So, are all the precepts like this? I mean, are they all more like guidelines? Precisely, Steve, they're guidelines rather than absolute laws. I don't think my father would like that idea. Being in the police, laws aren't really adaptable. They are if there's a war. Killing your neighbours is against the law, but killing enemy soldiers wasn't against the law in the world wars. And all those soldiers were someone's neighbours. I don't know how many were killed in Hiroshima or Nagasaki, but there must have been hundreds of thousands who died. Then there was the British firebombing of Dresden. Dresden wasn't a military target, it was a pottery town. So that should have been a war crime. But somehow it wasn't because Britain won the war. So what's legal and what's not legal become vague depending on the circumstances. And not everyone accepts that killing is all right in war, do they, said Steve like conscientious objectors. So this is obviously quite a big question. Yes, like the death penalty. It's legal to kill people who kill people, but not legal to kill the people who pass the death sentence or take the prisoner to the gallows. And so we talked through the evening until it was time to sleep. We left the subject of Annalie with Steve deciding he'd just have to grin and bear it. And he did. It didn't take long for Steve to relax about the idea. Unfortunately, nothing was ever mentioned again as to whether Vic had a girlfriend. What the eye did not see, or the brain cognise, was of no great consequence. Be that as it may, neither of us realised that I'd placed Annalie in a criminal context in terms of her having a sexual relationship with a minor. Perhaps that was just as well, as Steve would have found that an impossible situation. Time was ticking by. I did occasionally still wander back in my mind and images of the white lady morphing with Alice Rosalind Trevelyan would appear. 
flitting amongst the trees. It would have all been so easy if she had not departed for the Welsh borderlands. We'd be practically married by now. I'd long since stopped feeling guilty about Annalie in respect of Alice. After all, I would not have expected her to become an old maid on the basis of our having once been childhood sweethearts. That would have been entirely unreasonable. The same then had to apply to me. And yet that was still a line of logic that I had to apply to myself periodically. Memory of Alice was a strange thing, and that memory became increasingly strange as time went by. I found that I was confusing my visual memory of Alice with Tara. In some vague way, they had become the same person, or two manifestations of the same person. Tara had never spoken to me, and so the ideas that entered my mind when I encountered Tara, I remembered as being spoken with Alice's voice. <coughs> when I remembered Alice, she was rarely a young girl, but rather someone of indefinable age. I had no photograph of Alice, and so time allowed her to blur into powerful yet fragmented dream memories. Although Steve was almost two years older than me, I was tall for my age. I'd grown to full adult height, five foot eleven, by the age of eleven. My voice broke at ten, and the first traces of a moustache started appearing at the age of twelve. I met Annalie when I was fourteen and a half and was more or less a believable 16-year-old. I was somehow expecting to be six foot tall or more, but once I reached five foot eleven, nothing further happened. My father put it down to self-abuse. I overheard that one night after cleaning my teeth. I had to research the term and once I discovered it meant masturbation, I felt like telling my father, Don't worry, Dad, those days are over. I've got this really lovely lady friend, you see, so the days of self-abuse are over. No need to buy me a wrist brace. I'm saved. No. Life imprisonment and penal servitude in Tasmania would have resulted from that. My mother simply told my father that they should be grateful that I was the height I was. And my father, for once, said no more on the subject. He was five foot two. And, although a vociferous arguer, had the grace to know when he was beaten. It was rare for my mother to get the better of him, but that was one occasion when I had to stuff an entire handkerchief into my mouth to quell my laughter. My father was practically a dwarf, and with that thought, Grumpy came to mind from Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. It occurred to me, in terms of self-abuse, that maybe my father, being short, knew about the effects of self-abuse first-hand, as it were. My father had been a boy, after all, and Alice had been right about boys in general. Most of them were inveterate insecticides, as well as maniacal masturbators. They seemed to love nothing more than stamping on anything that lived. It was hideous. No wonder they'd been Nazis. My German grandmother had told me about the horrors of the Nazi regime in Germany, and as I looked at boys of my age, I could see that another generation of Nazis were rising all around me. I was somewhat alarmist on the subject, but my mother told me that I was a little too extreme in my view. 
These boys will not always be like this. They will learn of kindness later, but I can understand very well why you like girls better at this time. Just please do not mention this to your father, because he will not understand and will become angry with you again. I was lucky my mother understood the world and could explain it to me. My father just seemed to make everything incomprehensible. According to his reasoning, the problem was all to do with being a fool. He thought that somehow I had willfully decided to have senseless notions. My likes and dislikes had all been created in order to irritate him. I'd developed a stammer for the same reason. I'd known it would infuriate him, infuriate him and I'd started stammering deliberately. My mother told me that the doctor had said this was impossible and the doctor had had words with my father. After that, my father seemed to calm down a little and life became less imbued with his unaccountable rage. That was a decade in the past now and my stammer had receded somewhat. It was completely absent with Amelie and so I gained the sense of having transcended both childhood and adolescence. I'd be 16 in June, which was the age I was supposed to have been when I'd met Amelie. By that reckoning, I should now be 18 and slightly beyond skullduggery vis-a-vis -vis secret assignations. Maybe things were different in Switzerland and 18-year-olds were still under the parental wing. Maybe I was fortunate that Amelie wasn't au fait with the differences between our cultural mores. I often talked with Steve about the knife edge of my home situation, and so he was naturally edgy about what my father might do, especially with regard to Amelie, should I ever be found out. 